Just before our scripture reading this morning, I want to let you know uh, of one thing we're going to be doing a little bit differently in the, in the next few weeks. Uh, as this is the beginning of the Advent season, I'll first of all remind you, kind of what Mike reminded you already, uh, that Advent, a uh, very important season, and it's something that's very distinct from the Christmas season. Uh, for whatever reason, our types of evangelical churches, our brand or tradition of evangelical churches, uh, a while ago kind of uh, swapped out the tradition of Advent for the tradition of, of Christmas, kind of moved that in. And so what started to happen in our evangelical church is we stopped talking about Advent a little bit. Or what m- more started to happen is we just kind of conflated the two and talked about Advent essentially as if it was the Christmas season. And I just want to remind you that Advent and Christmas are actually two very different seasons and very different traditions in the church. And perhaps the easiest way to think about that is, whereas Christmas is a remembering and a celebrating of what happened in the past, the birth, the coming of Jesus into the world, uh, Advent is more a looking forward to what is yet to come and the second coming of Christ. And, And part of the reason why that's so important for the church is it holds always before the church, the season of Advent does, the reminder that heaven and new creation are not in the here and now right just yet. Okay? That's more to come. That actually that this world that we live in uh, is still dark, is still broken, still suffers, uh, all sorts of affliction. And it's also the reminder to us that our job as followers of Jesus is not to try to achieve or attain heaven and new creation in the here and now in our own individual lives, but rather our job is to shine the light of hope and what is yet to come in a dark and hurting and yet unrestored creation. Right? So, in other words, throughout the history of the church, the you know, Advent worship services were a time where we could give voice to and acknowledgement to that there is still a lot of brokenness, there is still a lot of pain, there is still a lot of suffering and hardship in this yet unfully restored creation that we are a part of. Uh, it is a time where we point our attention to Christ, the Christ who came, but the Christ all the more who is still yet to come. And it is the time where we remember that our responsibility as followers of Jesus is to wait faithfully, and in that waiting, to wait with and alongside those who have to walk through particular challenges in the darkness. And so our theme for Advent this year is going to be, well, I think you said there, waiting with those in the darkness. And we're going to be talking about, particularly, four things. Waiting with those who suffer loneliness, waiting with those who who suffer despair and the cloud of depression, Waiting with those who suffer uh, oppression and suffer unfairly or unjustly. And waiting with those who suffer grief over loss. And part of what we're going to do uh, for these four weeks in Advent is right before the sermon, right before the scripture reading, I've invited uh, somebody to come and to share just a testimony of what they have learned with walking with people, ministering with people who do experience this darkness in a very poignant way. And so this morning, before we turn to our scripture reading, uh, I invited Raj to come and share just a little bit of what he's learned uh, walking, in particular with men down at City Team in Chester, uh, as they experience times of deep loneliness. Uh, and so Raj will come and share. After he shares, the kids are, willing, are, are, are dismissed if they like to go to their classes. And then Amy's going to come and read our, our scripture reading for us this morning. So Raj, why don't you come and share? Excuse me. Good morning. Um, In many ways, this is a full circle experience for me. Um, My first official ministry assignment in the city of Chester was actually working in prison ministry at the state state correctional institution in Chester. And I did that with none other than Mike Norquist. And that was the first time I'd actually heard about Grace Church. And I was like, well, if Mike goes there, I better stay away. 
But as the Lord would have it, it, he brought my family here, and I'm really thankful for that. Um, as many of you know, I'm a program director at City Team. Um, after that ministry summit and um, doing prison ministry in Chester, um, I applied to City Team, a position to open up, because we had started working with guys coming out of that prison. And my wife and I started a transitional housing community for those men back in 2013. In many ways, you could say that all of the problems that the men that I work with face, and probably men in general, actually, can be um, answered by the problem of loneliness. If there's one thing that I've learned, and I've learned many things working with this population, is that many of the men that I work with would rather die than go back to prison. Um, in 2013, when we started that transitional housing community, we worked with a young man that had been incarcerated for about 13 years. And unfortunately, while he was with us, he had done something that put him at risk of going back to prison. Um, faced with that reality and confronted him with it, he chose to try to end his life in our housing community. He drank any household chemical that he could find, and then he started um, essentially butchering himself. Um, in the middle of it, he, I think he changed his mind and got scared and then ended up pounding on my door, essentially a bloody mess, reeking of bleach, and I had to rush him to the ER. Um, he, his life was saved and preserved, thank God. Um, but that gives you a sense of what it's like for a man to face going back to prison after being freed from that. I think that um, it's emotional for me to share that because it's something that was a very traumatic experience for me. And then you get to the point where you experience those things so much that you just sort of a numbness kind of sets into you. And I think that um, I realized that I'm not so different from the men that I work with. These are really extreme examples. You know, the problem of talking about my work at City Team is you just sort of are Debbie Downer, <laughs> you know, when you bring up these stories. But I think that what I've learned about men is that we, we experience these things in general. Um, I think Time Magazine, my sister was telling me that Time Magazine came out with an article not too long ago talking about how middle-aged men are some of the loneliest men. Um, and when you look at the, the percentage of depression and anxiety and suicide, it's, it's middle-aged men that are really suffering from that. So I've learned that, um, that many of the reasons why my men, the men that I work with turn to drugs and alcohol actually is connected to loneliness. I've heard so many stories where men say, I started drinking because I just wanted to learn how to be social. I just, when I drank, I liked myself around people more. Or if that man grew up in a profound situation of loneliness, he turned to drugs and alcohol as a way to sort of resolve his feeling of, of desperation. And um, in the past 20 years, two addiction researchers that have heavily influenced me, a guy named Bruce Alexander and a guy named Gabor Mate, essentially say that their research shows that it really is loneliness that is one of the strongest indicators of, or predispositions to addictive behavior. Gabor Mate defines loneliness as someone that lives in a prolonged state of stress, isolation, and powerlessness. And if you think about the prison experience, it essentially is institutionalized isolation, powerlessness, and stress. And he says that if you put any human person in a situation where they're stressed, isolated, and powerless for uh, a, a certain amount of time, they will turn to something um, as a way to cope, and that coping mechanism will eventually turn into full-blown addiction. I think the challenge that we face today is that we all live in a sort of institutionalized loneliness. I think the world offers us many counterfeits for that, and um, there's no shortage of, of alternatives to God and Jesus to try to resolve our loneliness, and I just don't think it works. And the men at City Team are a gift to me because even though the examples are very, really extreme, um, it makes me ask myself, what, wait a minute, what, I also feel those things in very profound ways. Um, I'll, I'll, sh I'll end by sharing that, you know, as you can imagine, COVID has made all these situations worse. Um, a gentleman that just joined our community was locked up in SCI Chester during the peak of the pandemic in 2020, and he wasn't allowed to leave his cell for three months at a time. Everything was brought to him. And then even, you know, three months when he would get a break from his cell, he was still in constant lockdown. Um, it was a situation where he had a physical altercation with his celly, as they say, and he was put in solitary confinement for, I, th I think, for about three months. 
And if you talk to any person that's been in solitary confinement for a certain amount of time, three things either happen. Either you go mad, you go crazy, you kill yourself, or you find something that helps you. And this particular man was given a Bible while he was in solitary confinement. And he said, if it wasn't for Christ having met him in that moment, he would have surely ended his life. So for the men that I work with at City Team, City Team is, for most of them, the first experience they have of experiencing community and experiencing a community of Christ. And to leave that or to lose that is, is surely death for them. Again, this is really rough stuff, and it's really hard, and I think the holidays for a lot of the residents is, is not just a, a time of physical darkness, but it's a time of psychological darkness. And I think the message of Advent for them you know, means so much because it means that there's something beyond prison, there's something beyond psychological enslavement. And, um, and so I could just talk on and on about this and depress everybody all day long. But what I can say is that for me in my own life, you know, what I believe is that Christ offers redemption and liberation for the men that I work with. And the reason why losing the community that they have at City Team is so devastating is because the community is so rich and so beautiful and they get experienced meaning and purpose. And all the reasons why they turned to drugs and, al drugs and alcohol in the first place is because they wanted meaning and purpose and belonging and for them to be able to experience that without turning to anything destructive is, is sincerely liberation. And how much more for us that don't have to go through this experience, how much more should it be that for us? So thanks for letting me share. I hope I haven't ruined your day. <laughs> but I hope that, I hope that it really does um, motivate you to open your eyes and to see how much um, you have to be thankful for. And that if you are struggling with loneliness or suffering from that, um, you're in the right place because, you know, um, no one should be lonely in church. Amen. Yes, children, you're dismissed if you're not already gone. Our scripture this morning is from Psalm 68 and Hebrews 12, if you'll please stand. Psalm 68. God shall arise, his enemies shall be scattered, and those who hate him shall flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so you shall drive them away. As wax melts before fire, so the wicked shall perish before God. But the righteous shall be glad. They shall exult before God. They shall be jubilant with joy. Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. Lift up a song to him who rides through the deserts. His name is the Lord. Exult before him. Father of the fatherless and protector of widows, is God in his holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home. He leads out prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. Hebrews 12, beginning with verse 28. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship, with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Let, the marriage, let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. This ends the reading of God's word. You may be seated.
you see me notice, if you notice me uh, walking a little bit more stiff or a little hunched over, it's because this past Thursday was our annual Grace Church uh, Thanksgiving football game. <laughs> the annual delightful reminder that I am much older and out of shape than I thought I was. <laughs> Uh, but this year it was fun because for the first time, I had two of my daughters come and play uh, with the, at the football game. My daughters have, are not notoriously known for being too interested in football. Kate has started to watch a few games with me. Uh, but so it was great to have a couple of them coming, and I'm hoping that's going to continue next year. I hope that all the daughters <laughs> will join in next year. And, and I was feeling that uh, while we were playing the game. Like, I was starting to feel like towards the end of the game, I'm like, okay, how, how can I make this more enjoyable for them so that they will be, want to come back next year or, you know, do this again or not think this is the stupidest waste of time that I spent on a Thanksgiving morning. I'm never doing this again. And so towards the end of the game, you know, me and a couple of the, of the other folks who were playing, we're trying to think, okay, how can we get the girls, you know, a little bit more involved and get them the ball, you know, whatever, all this stuff. And it reminded me of, uh, or as I think about it, it reminds me of us of a, this, this uh, almost sadistic research project that some researchers did where they got a bunch of people into a room. I think this was on a college campus. They got a bunch of people in a room. They did this multiple times, and they set up this study where they were just these group of people were just going to gather in a circle and just kind of pass a ball back and forth around the circle, except they, there was one individual who, unbeknownst to them, they had told everybody else in the group, don't pass the ball to that individual. So everybody's passing the ball, bouncing around, except to this one person. Okay, and so you can imagine the scene. You know, everybody's there, and everybody's smiling and saying hi and passing the ball around. Everybody's all part of it, except for this one person. Maybe, you know, smiling, giving some nods and all. But then, you know, a few minutes into the game, she's not touching the ball at all. It's not coming her way. and gets a little bit awkward, and so, you know, maybe starts to move in towards the, the middle of the circle just a little bit or move around to sort of get some people's attention. And then as the game goes on and still not getting, uh, you know, any participation in this, in this little game that's taking place here, now this awkwardness is turning to just, uh, you know, a little bit of an angst. And time and time again, they found this person uh, very quickly becoming very disinterested with the game at best or at worst, wanting to get out of this very uncomfortable situation and starting to make up excuses for why, ah, sorry, okay, it's, I, I got to go now. And what these researchers found is that they would, after they would interview people about how they felt or whatever, and especially this person, uh, interestingly enough, they found this person voicing concerns about uh, almost like despairing type things. Or almost I started to hear this person talk about general meaninglessness and purposelessness of life. They found these individuals at a higher whatever predisposition in that moment to almost despair of life a little bit. In a way, what these researchers found, surprise, surprise, is that there is this deep longing in humans to belong and to be seen and to be heard and to be known and to be cared for and to feel like a part of, of a group. And when that doesn't happen, there is a really deep sort of distress that takes place and that is felt that trickles out into all areas of, a variety of areas of life. You know, and I don't know if you know, but before, before the COVID pandemic and all we ever talked about was COVID, there were actually quite a few medical professionals who were starting to talk about this other epidemic that they were noticing in American culture. You had like the former Surgeon General of the United States saying that actually there's a very deadly epidemic rising in American culture, and it's the epidemic of loneliness. And you were starting to see these alarming statistics, some like Raj pointed out, about middle-aged men and their rising rates of loneliness and the dangerous effects that that has. Or they were starting to see, especially in the younger generations, stark rises in these experiences of loneliness, such that for the first time we were seeing people in the 18 to 22-year-old range, I mean, think about that range, experiencing or at least identifying more experiences of loneliness than people 75 and older. Think about that. And what a lot of these medical professionals were trying to do was show that not only is this rising at an alarming rate, but it also has, it's also a big problem. It leads to increased levels of anxiety. It leads to increased levels of depression. There are some medical journalists who say it actually leads to increased risk of heart disease and dementia. 
One medical journal said uh, loneliness is on par with, perhaps even worse than obesity for heart issues. Or one medical journal went so far as to say that uh, chronic loneliness is akin to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It's that dangerous. And so look, again, the goal here for this morning is not to talk about everything the Bible has to say about loneliness. It's more to say that we live in a world where there is this darkness, there is this pain, and loneliness is a big part of it. And the calling of the church is to wait and walk with those who endure that loneliness. That's part of our calling. And so we're going to look at that this morning. We're basically going to look at three quick things. One, I want you to see from our text about how the problem of loneliness is actually, biblically speaking, a fundamental condition of broken humanity. I want you to see the God whose heart bends towards those who are lonely. And then I just want you to see some very concrete things that show up in various places throughout the New Testament. We're focused zeroing in on Hebrews of ways that we can walk alongside those who perhaps suffer in this area. Okay? So first of all, acknowledging that this is a fundamental problem with human existence. And for this, I want you to think with me about Psalm 68. Okay? Psalm 68 is a psalm that looks forward. Right? It's looking forward to the day when God is going to come and he's going to restore his creation. He's going to heal the wounds. He's going to fix uh, this ravaged creation. And he's going to deal with his enemies who, have wreaked, who are wreaking havoc throughout his creation and the lives of his people. Okay, so the psalm starts, God will arise, and his enemies will be scattered, those who hate him will flee, but the righteous will rejoice. The righteous will see it and rejoice. The righteous will see it and will be filled with jubilant joy. The righteous will see it and will sing songs of praise and celebration to this God. And then in verse 4, it starts to describe this God, who we're going to be celebrating and singing praises to. It almost sort of like lays out some of the lyrics of these praise songs that we're going to be attributing to God when he comes and he does this. And so we'll refer to him as the father of the fatherless and the protector of the widows. Nothing too surprising there. Right? God has always had a concern for those who are perhaps most vulnerable, uh, those most at risk of missing out of the life and the richness of his creation that he intended for his people to enjoy. And this in the ancient world was your widows and orphans. Right? Because in the ancient world, patriarchal society, it was the men, it was the husbands, the fathers who provided the life for their family and also protected that life. Right? So to be without a father, to be without a husband was to be at risk, to be vulnerable. God's eyes see those people. He's a father to the fatherless. He's a protector of the widows. He's the one who leads out, as the text says, prisoners into prosperity. Those who have been oppressed and held captive by the enemies of God. Right? God is going to come and to liberate them and to deliver them and to set them free into prosperity. Again, nothing too surprising there. All the prophetic passages are dealing with God dealing with his enemies and how they have oppressed his people. Okay? But then in the middle of that is this other one that sort of stands out to me, a little bit surprising, maybe just me, but it says he settles the solitary or he settles the alone into homes. And again, that's sort of striking to me because I guess, I don't know, I guess uh, we, we maybe are trained to think of loneliness as, okay, a problem, but maybe not that big of a problem. I mean, look, let's face it, our... Uh, our modern Western American culture, we almost, we come so close to praising aloneness, right? In the way we exalt rugged individualism, where you find out who you are and you, you know, live life on your own terms and you don't let anyone or anything get in your way. In other words, we, we come really close to praising this notion that you don't conform your identity in any way to the identity or the standards of the community around you, and you don't conform your life to the needs of the community. We've kind of walled ourselves off from any kind of communal identity or communal obligation. Ironically, we have perhaps walled ourselves into uh, a prison of isolation, but that's for another time. 
But the, the bigger issue is that I, in that, I don't know if we view aloneness as so much of a problem. But throughout the pages of the scriptures, this is one of the fundamental problems of broken human condition. I mean, think about it. Go all the way back to the very beginning. We're told in the earliest pages of the Bible, it is not good for man to be alone. And then when you think about what actually happens when sin enters into the picture and they choose to reject their creator and rebel against him and live life on their own terms, what happens? It's just a wake of destruction in all these relationships. Right? Think about it. They have to go and they have to hide from God. And then because of their sinfulness. And eventually they're cast out of his garden, out of his presence of the garden. In other words, that relationship with God, there is an estrangement now in that relationship. Well, you think of the relationship between the man and the woman. Now there's shame. That's what they have to cover up. There's sinful blaming and accusation, right? These things that are now getting in between such that that perfect relationship, that perfect unity and oneness that they enjoy now, there's a bit of an estrangement in there too. Or you think even of the relationship with the whole rest of the world around them and how they're cast out of this paradise garden and they now have to survive in wilderness places. Well, now the ground and their bodies, the physical creation, which kind of worked and originally, in partnership with them, now fights back. Now there's thorns growing up all over the place. And now there's pains in childbirth. And now there's decay and ultimately death, right? So there's estrangement even in our relationship with the physical creation we were meant to enjoy. It's not good for man to be alone. And yet, what do we see as sin starts coming into the picture? All these estranged relationships now. In other words, this not goodness, this fundamental sort of loneliness is creeping into human existence. And this is why all throughout the Old Testament you find people experiencing this. You find prophets crying out in desperate conditions of loneliness. You hear in the Psalms over and over again cries and prayers of, of loneliness, whether it's Psalm 25, you know, pleading with God to, to be gracious to him because he is lonely and afflicted. Or Psalm 38, where he's pleading before God that all my friends and companions shun me and my neighbors have left me. Or Psalm 142, where the psalmist is pleading for God to look upon him and have mercy on him because there's a trap laid before him and he looks to the left, he looks to the right, and there is no one who has regard for him. There is no place of refuge for him. There is no one to care for his soul, it says. Or it's why you, you, you hear the psalmist at times even questioning God. God, why do you seem so far away from me? Why do you seem so far from my groanings? Do you even hear? Do you even see? Why have you forsaken me? Or Psalm 88, why have you made the darkness my only companion? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just piling on the depressiveness here from, <laughs> from Rod. This is a heavy thing. And what you basically you need to see is that Throughout the Old Testament, throughout the scriptures, loneliness, it is a fundamental problem, a fundamental condition of broken, fallen human existence. And this is why God has eyes on the lonely and why God is concerned to, or why it is such an important thing for God to move the lonely into homes and into families Okay, which is actually the second point. The first point, understand this is a problem, biblically speaking. Second point is see that God is a God whose heart bends towards those who are lonely. And that God is a God whose, because his heart bends that way, it is his intention to move the lonely and the isolated and the solitary into homes. Right? And you can think about it all throughout the scriptures. This is what God does. God is always building and preserving and redeeming homes and families. You know, whether you go all the way back to the beginning with Abraham and Sarah, where, you know, they had no kids, they had no extended family, and God comes to them and he says, I'm going to make you a great family with descendants as numerous as the stars, and I'm going to bring you into my home and to my land, right? Or then whenever he is meeting with those descendants of Abraham after he's delivered them from Egypt and he's brought them out into the wilderness en route to that good land of promise 
and they have a stop off at Mount Sinai and basically he constitutes them there as a covenant community and he gives them commandments for how they ought to live in covenant relationship with him and in covenant relationship with one another. And then all throughout the whole rest of the Old Testament, how God deals with them, not just as isolated individuals, but he deals with them collectively as a family. Or you come into the New Testament, on and on we could go, where this family now is expanding to include people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. This family is growing into the great family of Christ, the church. We're, in our Wednesday night theology group, we're, we've started reading this book entitled Misreading Scripture Through Western Eyes. And I, we haven't gotten there yet, but I noticed that one of the chapters, of course, is going to talk about how, as good Westerners, we tend to read the Scriptures individualistically. That's this, I don't know, instruction book on how individually we become saved and how individually we leave out, live out lives of righteousness. But when you take off our Western glasses and you put on maybe other more traditional cultures, uh, you see that the, fam- that, the, that the Scriptures are very... It's a very collective story. It's a communal story. It's a family story. It's a God, it's a, a God working, building, and maintaining his family. Which is why, coincidentally, when you look at scenes of new creation and the future, you very rarely, if ever, see scenes of just random individuals doing their thing or whatever. It's always symbolic pictures of the whole family whether it's New Jerusalem coming down, which is a symbolic representation of the people of God, or whether it's the bride of Christ, which is this one symbol of the full family, or whether it's the marriage supper of the Lamb, where all of God's people are gathered around the table celebrating and enjoying nourishment as we share together of the life of Christ. In other words, here's the point. God has his eyes set on his family and building and maintaining and preserving this family of Christ. And his heart bends for those who would not be experiencing that family and would be solitary or being alone in loneliness. And he moves to settle them into homes and into this family. And so the last point being... If God is concerned about this, if God's hard heart bends this way, so should ours as the church, as that family. And I had, uh, I had us read Hebrews 13, just one of any pas- numerous passages in, in the New Testament that we could look at that gives just some very specific instructions on how to do that. You know, Hebrews 13, well, I started uh, at the end of Hebrews 12 where... It's this great looking forward to this future kingdom, which we are starting to experience in the here and now. And so this, the, the closing admonition is, so let us be grateful for receiving this kingdom that cannot be shaken. And let us worship God with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. And then here's what more of that looks like. Let brotherly love endure. There's one thing. I know some of you maybe... <laughs> Uh, blood family relationships maybe are not, uh, I don't know what, maybe there's, there's some tension there or whatever, some angst, I don't know. I, I'm very blessed in life to have my, my brothers be some of the closest people to me who know me best, uh, and despite years of, well, probably in light, probably as a result of years of wanting to kill each other growing up, uh, we have forged this, this bond where we know each other really well, we care for one another, and probably would do anything for, for the other. Which makes this passage stand out to me where he says, let brotherly love endure. That we are called to that kind of love within the family of Christ. We are called to know one another. uh, To enjoy sharing life with one another. And to do whatever for the other. So let love endure, not just any old love, but let brotherly love endure. There's one way we can do that. Another way is we show hospitality, as the text says. And I'll remind you here that hospitality is more than just inviting people over for dinner on a Friday night, some friends, you know, family. Hospitality, biblically speaking, it's literally sharing your life with another. It's opening up all that you are 
your home, your family, your time, your energy, your resources, your story, your personality, everything, opening that up, inviting another into that, and sharing that with them. Uh, that's why at the end of the passage it says, so keep yourself free from the love of money. Because the love of money it will, will get in the way of that. If you are controlled by this passionate love of money, you're probably not going to be too interested in opening up and sharing all of that, your wealth and resources with others. A controlling love of money leads to tight fists and tight arms around the things that we have secured for ourselves. A love of Christ leads to being more like Christ who opens himself up in love and hospitality to others. And you notice as well, too, the text says, and you don't just show hospitality, you know, to those that you enjoy, those that you're comfortable with, your friends, the friend, people you know. It, open, you show hospitality to strangers, even. And the ancient church was actually, they, they were actually known for this. They were doing this all the time, and it made them look really weird, actually. The ancient church was opening up their homes to all sorts of people, strangers in the city who were suffering from really sketchy sicknesses, plagues, or to unwanted orphans that were discarded in trash heaps all around the city, or to widows, or to the poor, or to sojourners who were just traveling through and had, you know, uh, needed a place to stop and to rest and to re find refreshment or whatever. The church was doing this so much that they were looking stark, starkly strange such that the surrounding culture actually started eventually asking questions. What, what is this? <laughs> Who is this church? And even more, who is this Jesus that they worship? So we let brotherly love endure. We be a people who, who open up and we share all that has been given to us with others as there is need. And we look out for prisoners too. Right? Literal prisoners. Quite, well, quite literally, in, in that day, a lot of the church people were being carried off into prison and say, hey, don't forget them. As we've already heard, that can be a huge place of distressing loneliness. So don't forget them. You know, but even for me, as I look at that, 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 that little line there, to look out for the prisoners, actually reminds me that part of the calling is to just have eyes open to those who might be suffering loneliness. Right, when I think of the prisoners, we think of the people who are often just overlooked and who are, you know, shuffled aside into these institutions, right, because they've committed some crime and, well, they're getting what they deserve and once they've paid their debt, debt to society, well, then I can acknowledge them as humans again and look out for them. Hopefully, you understand that people of the gospel of Christ don't have the luxury of thinking that way. Okay, but the bigger picture here is that, you know, if you're going to be a people who look out for the lonely, you've got to open your eyes and you've got to see those who are oftentimes overlooked. So those are just three things that stand out for me from the text. It's, hey, let brotherly love continue. Open up, share your life, show hospitality. All the while, make sure your eyes are open, looking for people who might be experiencing loneliness that you can love and you can serve and that you can do this with. So, here, just in the last couple of minutes here, let me, let me sum this all up, and then let me maybe just say one or two quick words to anybody who might be experiencing the pain of loneliness here this morning. Let me sum this up. Let me remind you, okay, the calling here. Well, I mean, let's go all the way back to the very beginning and acknowledge that loneliness is a, is a growing and a major problem in our American culture. People are, are feeling lonely all over the place. Right? Whether it's the people who are feeling lonely because they don't have an immediate family right now to share life with. No spouse, no kids or whatever. And that, boy, that, that experience of loneliness is particularly poignant this time of year while everybody is with their families and enjoying all these festive holiday traditions. And they're not. That pain of that loneliness peaks oftentimes this time of year. There's people experiencing loneliness because, you know, their life from beginning to end, is lived in service to others. Whether it's lived in service to, to their kids, or to their coworkers, or to their neighborhood, or to their church family. And all the while, they feel like nobody is looking to them. We're seeing them. We're caring for them. Right? I think of 
You know, mothers come to mind here in this instance, where it seems like their whole life is lived pouring into their children, the needs of their children. And especially with their younger kids, you know, or whatever, but that it can be all consuming and it can keep you from enjoying other relationships or even being able to be present in church sometimes, right? And you're, you're spending yourself there and the kids aren't, you know, coming back. And, but what about you, mom? <laughs> what needs do you have? How can I care and serve you today? And sometimes those people can easily get overlooked because they're not able to be present with us on a Sunday morning or whatever because they're off chasing their kids somewhere. Some people are experiencing loneliness because they're walking through a particular experience of pain. Whether it's deep anxiety or depression, or whether it's grief, or whether it's a physical suffering that they are fearful of. And because nobody around them knows that particular suffering that they're, enjoy- they're experiencing, not enjoying, and is not able to enter into that suffering and empathize with them in that, they feel alone in that. There are people experiencing loneliness because, well, maybe they're workaholics. <laughs> We're not workaholics, but they just, their whole life is consumed with work, and they wouldn't consider their, cons- their co-workers friends or companions. They're more rivals and competitors or whatever. Or there's some people experiencing the effects of loneliness, maybe because of their own sinfulness, and that in their sinfulness, they have wounded others, and they have estranged themselves from certain relationships, and they're feeling the aloneness of that. Or there's people experiencing loneliness because... The ravages of death have pulled somebody who for their whole life they've walked through life with. And now what do I do in this massive gaping hole in my life? Again, loneliness, a big problem. Something that is fundamental to human condition. Our job is to have eyes open to it. To see the problem. To see the God whose heart bends towards the lonely and the God who calls us to be a family together, one with each other, but also for the lonely as well too, in the way that we show love, in the way that we open ourselves up to one another, in the way we look out for one another and for those who might be lonely and suffering around us. And lastly, let me just say a quick word. If you're here this morning and you are suffering with loneliness, Man, you could spend multiple sermons talking about that. But what I would want to say to you is that first and foremost, I want you to know that you are experiencing part of the fundamental broken condition of human existence. (laughs) That's not exactly the most encouraging thing in the world. But what that is, is why that is so important for you to see, is because there's not a quick fix to that. The fix for that comes in the resurrection and in the new creation. And when Christ returns to restore all things, that's when that fix comes, right? And the temptation for all of us when we feel emotional distress or when we feel pain is to look for some sort of patch or some sort of fix to cover that or to fix that problem. And so the temptation for you, perhaps quite literally, is going to be to run into the arms, literally, of anyone or anything who will patch that loneliness. And I just want to tell you, it's not that easy or it's not that simple should say it that way. You're dealing with something much more fundamental. Second, I would say, let the biblical picture of hope (laughs) bathe you every day. You look forward to the day where there will be no more tears, where there will be no more uh, deep angst of the heart, and there will be no more unfulfilled longings, but all will be restored as all the relationships are restored between God and his people, with each other, and his whole creation. And in the meantime, as you wait, you look to the king who's going to, re- who's going to do that. The king who not only promises to do that, to finish that project one day, but also because his heart bent so much towards you, the lonely, didn't just open up the heavens and bark down orders from on high, but actually chose to incarnate himself to enter into broken human existence so they could walk alongside. You look to the king who knows full well what it feels like to be betrayed by your closest companions, who knows full well to have your whole kinsmen, your whole countrymen, everyone around you to reject you and to cry out cries to crucify you in your most vulnerable moment. 
The king who knows even what it feels like to be abandoned by his heavenly father as the weight of the sin's world is placed upon him. The king who, as the old hymn says, suffered and died alone. So that he might be, as the writer of Hebrews says, a brother to you in your time of weakness. So that he might know you and know what you're experiencing and know what you're enduring and can know specifically how to enter into that and be empathetic with that, and who can then be the even greater high priest who knows how to poignantly apply grace and mercy to you in your loneliness. And as you see that Jesus, and you hold tight to him for that daily provision of grace and mercy, well then maybe you find just enough strength to then participate with the rest of the church and opening eyes to others who are lonely, and being able to show brotherly love that has been shown to you, and showing hospitality that has been shown to you, and maybe, just maybe, in doing that, clinging to Christ, you find a deeper belonging, a deeper sense of purpose, maybe even a deeper sense of joy than anything else, anything else the world can afford to you. point is, all of us together, we are called to wait And to walk with those in darkness, all of us together, having been welcomed into the family, the home of Christ, on account of his great love for us, and on account of his heart that bends towards us in our most vulnerable and lonely moments, we are called to participate that and have eyes open to those who suffer, be willing to let our hearts be bent in that direction, and to be willing to love and give of ourselves sacrificially until the great day comes when the king comes and restores all things and puts an end to the darkness. And so we look forward to that and we wait faithfully on it all by God's help in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite our worship team to come up forward and actually what we're going to do now is we're going to celebrate communion. So I invite the, uh, the men to grab the elements. And they're going to come and they're going to put the elements on uh, these two tables here off to the side. And uh, we partake of communion here. As a reminder of two things. One, a reminder of God's, of Christ's radical hospitality towards us. That he literally shared everything that he had to the last drop of blood for our life and for our redemption. He literally gave himself in brotherly love for us to the full. So we, we remember that. And we come and we partake of the bread and cup as symbols to remind us and draw us into reflection on that. It's also a reminder that we do this together. That we are not just isolated individuals coming and feeding on Christ and finding life of salvation. But no, we are a family united together by the church, by the by the spirit of Christ, by that blood and body of Christ. And so we partake together and we partake not only with eyes on Christ, the body of Christ on the cross, but with eyes on the body of Christ, as Paul will say in 1 Corinthians, the church together. So uh, as the... um, Worship team leads us in song. Uh, Oh, we have a table in the middle as well, too. Which one is the gluten-free table? I always That's the gluten-free table. There you go. I always forget to point that out. But as the worship team plays, we'll uh, invite you to sing. And as you feel led, as you're singing, come to the table with your brothers and sisters. Feed on Christ as a foretaste of that, you know, marriage supper of the Lamb that one day we'll all enjoy together. Come partake, uh, come grab some bread and uh, the, the juice and... Once everybody has received and we're all back in our spots, uh, I'll come and pray for the elements and we'll partake together.